Okay, so about half. So the half of you can go to sleep for the first 45 minutes, as I wish I could, and then you can wake up for the last 45 minutes, maybe. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I thought, uh, because this is officially a school of physics, there might be some physicists here who are not of, in, don't immediately know what B minus V versus V means, and why astronomers use magnitudes, and all this wonderful stuff. Um, <clears throat> and maybe don't know what the AGB is and so on. So <clears throat> I thought I would give a sort of a quick introduction to what happens to stars and how they <clears throat> end up in their final states because a lot of the most interesting transients are stars getting somewhere closer to their endpoints or actually are the endpoints uh, collecting matter from other places and uh, exploding. So <clears throat> the transients of uh, have become, I would say, they were popular several hundred, several even thousand years ago. The ancient Chinese and Korean astronomers made their warning, made their money warning the king about changes in the sky. And now we all hope to similarly become rich by telling people about the exciting changes in the sky, but uh, things that are finger than you can see with the naked eye. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so let's start in with the transients. So first we'll start with the equations of stellar structure. So in the simplest version, uh, we'll consider non-relativistic stars initially, so no general relativity. We'll get to that later with neutron stars. We'll say the stars are spherical, they're not rotating, they're in equilibrium, equilibrium both hydrostatically, so they're not collapsing or expanding. Uh, in thermal equilibrium, so that's defined to mean that if I generate energy inside a little parcel of gas, um, <clears throat> the, the net flux of energy out through its surfaces must balance the energy that's being generated inside it so that there's no net change in the temperature of that uh, or density of that gas element. And the reason the energy is being generated in the star is by nuclear energy. Uh, so in the core of the star, particularly where the density is high and the temperature is high, nuclei can <clears throat> tunnel through uh, the Coulomb barriers repelling the positive charges, and <clears throat> if they manage to tunnel through, then they can undergo a strong reaction, or sometimes accompanied by beta decay, weak interactions, uh, to make new nuclei, usually at least up through iron-releasing energy, and that energy is what then powers the, uh, this powers the star, and the leakage of that energy from the core, where it's being generated out to the surface, is what's carrying the heat while the body of the star, again, remains nearly in hydrostatic and thermal equilibrium through mo most of the phases of its evolution. Now, <clears throat> to describe what's happening in the star, we need some pieces of microphysics. So the first is just the equation of state. So for hydrostatic equilibrium, we need the pressure on the top to balance the pressure on the bottom, plus the weight of the material inside. Uh, so we need the pressure, and the pressure depends on the density and the temperature. It depends on the mass per particle, if it's an ideal gas. If it's degenerate, it depends on the mass per electron, because it's electron degeneracy that's providing the pressure. And so, for example, in the simplest non-degenerate case, we just have the ideal gas law, NKT, written as rho over mu. And then in stars, the radiation pressure could be important, one, one third AT to the fourth. Um, you often need the entropy, so the entropy per unit mass uh, for, again, non-degenerate ideal gas is the entropy of the radiation in the entropy of the, in the, entropy of the gas. Then, <clears throat> because we're interested in the radiation getting out through the star, we need the opacity. Uh, <clears throat> we'll discuss later, there's a subtlety about opacity is the cross-section per unit mass, but the cross-section depends on frequency. So what's happened to the frequency? Well, this has been averaged over a black body in an appropriate way called the Rossell and mean. Uh, and that also depends on the density, the temperature, and the composition. And astronomers call X as the fraction of a per gram of material that's in hydrogen. Y is the fraction that's in helium. And Z is the fraction that's in everything else, according to usual prescriptions of abundances, which probably are wrong for any individual star except the sun, but that's the way astronomers usually count things, but <clears throat> we do know that, in fact, the description in many cases, especially at low abundances, needs to be more detailed than this, that the ratio of iron <clears throat> peak elements to many other elements is not the same as in the sun. 
<clears throat> but <clears throat> the opacity at very high temperatures and low densities is just electron scattering, just the Thompson scattering cross-section. Uh, then at intermediate temperatures and densities, there's the Kramer's law, and then at low temperatures, every, everything gets very complicated. There's individual atoms and molecules <clears throat> uh, recombining, dust forming, and so on. Um, and this you know, suffices for your first introduction to stellar physics. Uh, if you actually want to do any calculations, you need carefully calculated tables, which I refer to there. And finally, there's the nuclear energy generation, which again depends on lots of measured nuclear reactions. Uh, <clears throat> in stars and at low temperatures, below, sort of cooler than the sun, center of the sun, uh, the reaction uh, goes through the so-called PP chain, which has a rather weak temperature dependence. For hotter stars, it goes through the CNO cycle, which you notice is density times temperature to roughly the 17th power. Of course, it's really an inverse exponential. And helium to carbon goes through the triple alpha reaction, and that one scales its temperature roughly to the 40th power. So these are extremely temperature sensitive, and that's why the energy generation is concentrated in a very small region in the center of the star, because if I change the temperature by 5%, then I have the reaction rates per gram. Okay, <clears throat> so we start off with mass conservation. So if it's non-relativistic, we don't have to worry about what we mean by mass. Uh, so just 4 pi r squared rho is the rate of change of mass with respect to radius. And <clears throat> the luminosity that's going through a given radius is just given by of the energy generation in that volume. Uh, <clears throat> I've talked only about energy generation. Of course, there can be energy losses if things get really sufficiently hot and dense. Neutrinos can be generated, and you have to subtract those off in this term because they, except in the very late stages, free stream out of the star. And this L here, by convention, usually just refers to what's being carried in thermal energy by convection and in photons. And as I'll discuss later, the one thing that's really left out here is the possibility that there might actually be, in addition to convection, there might be waves carrying energy, which might, might actually be quite important in very late stages of evolution. Okay, so next we get to uh, the slightly more interesting equations, the hydrostatic equilibrium, which just, again, says that <clears throat> the difference in the pressure between the dot top and the bottom of a layer is just the weight of the layer inside it. Um, and then the more subtle equation, the radiative equilibrium equation. So <clears throat> for photons, to, uh, uh, photons will carry heat because the center of the star is hot, the surface is cold. So if I consider some little layer with a thickness about equal to the mean free path of a photon, one over kappa rho, there's more heat coming up from the bottom, which is hotter than there is going down from the top, which is colder. And so if I think of this as emitting a black body, flux is roughly sigma t to the fourth going up with the temperature at the bottom, and sigma t at the larger level, so a little bit less, going down. The difference between those two, the net radiation flux, is of order delta r times d by dt of that, d, d by dr of that flux. And <clears throat> so doing a proper angle average, which I haven't done here, um, <clears throat> you can end up with this equation. Uh, which you can describe the radiation flux as the gradient of the radiation pressure times C, and that <clears throat> turns out to be just this uh, Russell and mean opacity rho times the radiation flux, which is just L over 4 pi r squared. So the reason that this is a funny kind of mean is that you can see that the, if I consider different frequencies, if there's a frequency where the mean free path is much longer, it, sees, it makes a much bigger contribution to the flux than frequencies where the mean free path is very short. And so there's a weighting by one over the opacity, which appears in the, as a function of frequency, which appears in that Rosslyn mean. Okay, so just to sort of set the scale of, for the sort of time scales for the nuclear fuel to run out, if you consider a star like the sun, it takes about 10 to the 10 years for the nuclear fuel to run out. The time it takes for the total heat inside the sun to escape is about 10 to the 7 years. So <clears throat> it's a very good approximation that the sun is nearly in thermal equilibrium 
in its current state <clears throat> because it would take 10 to the 10 years for the nuclear fuel to change the composition. And meanwhile, it's had 10 to the, in only 10 to the 7 years, it's readjusted all of the, the heat distribution within the sun. Uh, if I go up to 10, 10, 10 solar masses, the total nuclear lifetime is around 10 million years, and the thermal time scale is about 10 to the 5. And at 100 solar masses, is just a couple million years for the <coughs> uh, evolution time scale. So I've argued so far that the star should nearly be in equilibrium, but there are a few phases where there's sudden changes in the star. Uh, for example, when, a <coughs> uh, when it runs out of nuclear fuel in one stage and has to contract the core, during that contraction, um, the star can be out of thermal equilibrium. When it's out of thermal equilibrium and contracting, there's one more source of energy, which I didn't really write down properly in those equations, which is as it collapses and shrinks, it's liberating gravitational binding energy, which is an additional energy source that needs to be put in the equations that I didn't write down. Now, <clears throat> the nastiest and perhaps most important part of stellar structure is convection. So if everything were just radiation equilibrium, it would all be beautiful fundamental physics and you could just measure opacities and calculate them and then calculate the structure of the stars. But unfortunately, it happens quite often that the temperature gradient that you find if you want to carry the heat just by radiation turns out to be an unstable temperature gradient. So <clears throat> if we consider uh, some region of this star, so radius is increasing outwards, so gravity is pointing down, and I consider some little blob of material, but not too small, a fairly nice healthy sized blob, so that as it rises it's large enough that the radiation and heat within it is trapped, so that as it rises I can think of it as just adiabatically expanding, it's not losing significant heat to the inside or the outside. Then <clears throat> the change in the density of the blob as it goes up <clears throat> is the change in the pressure, and if the blob is moving up very slowly compared to the sound speed, sound waves will be able to cross back and forth inside it, so it will stay nearly in pressure equilibrium with the outside. So the pressure inside the blob is nearly equal to the pressure outside. So inside the star, in the average medium, there is a gradual decrease of the pressure as I go up. So as I go from R to R plus dr, there will be some change delta P external in the external pressure. Um, and then if I want to calculate the density of the blob up here, it's just the change in the pressure of the blob, which is the same as the pressure of the exterior because they're in equilibrium, divided by dp d rho at constant entropy. So that's the adiabatic uh, <coughs> dp d rho, <coughs> d rho, so roughly the, the sound speed squared in the blob. <coughs> now, the change in the external density is given by delta p divided by dp dr divided by d rho dr, namely dp d, d rho in the external medium, just defined in this average. <coughs> so you can now see that if I compare these two, that <coughs> if this term is <coughs> uh, larger in magnitude than this one, <coughs> uh, <coughs> these delta p externals, of course, are negative. The pressure is increasing as you go up. Uh, so if this is less than of uh, dp d rho in the external average, then <clears throat> the external blob is going to be under dense, right? This term will be smaller than that one, so the density in the blob will be, <clears throat> uh, have a larger change, be more negative uh, than in the surroundings, and that means that it will be lower density and continue to accelerate upwards. So that's unstable. If the inequality were reversed, then the blob would be denser than the surroundings and it would fall back down and be stable. Um, <clears throat> so this ratio is usually called the adiabatic <clears throat> adiabatic gamma. If I sorry, it's, if I take d log p d log rho. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now there's a famous approximation to try to describe how much heat actually gets carried by these blobs if they're unstable. And so the picture is that if I go up a distance where the pressure is changed by a factor of two or e. That sort of sets the maximum blob size and the maximum height. It makes sense to talk about rising before I have to invent new blobs. Uh, <clears throat> and the acceleration is just g times delta rho over rho. 
which gives the velocity, which is the acceleration, which is g delta rho over rho, times that characteristic scale height divided by v, so that's the time it takes to rise. So one gets the square of the rise speed as being roughly <coughs> uh, g times the scale height times the density fluctuation. So collecting all of these, you can get an estimate for how much heat is being carried in the blobs. But obviously you might guess that, well, maybe it was twice the scale height or half the scale height. And, you know, maybe I should have used the mean density instead of the top or the bottom. So there are clearly factors of a few floating around in there. And indeed there are factors of a few and different people have different opinions about what a few should be. And those are all the different mixing length prescriptions that get used in stars and they actually matter, unfortunately. <clears throat> okay, um, so a little bit in further details. Of course, I described everything in. This is sort of, uh, if you go back one slide, this is sort of the maximal flux you can expect. I think that the profile adjusted, so we almost a diabetic. Yeah, yeah. So, so, well, whatever this dp d, d rho external is, I haven't said what it actually is. Right, if it were the radiative gradient, that's the absolute maximum. Of course, it autom as the. Once you start having efficient convection, then it changes this gradient to produce a small value. So you have to iterate to find out what it is, as, as Raym said. Okay, <clears throat> um, there's one more little subtlety I'll just mention. So the first thing is it's sort of more convenient to use dTdr instead of dRho dr, since the radiative equations we were solving use temperature. So <clears throat> uh, that involves introducing the mean molecular weight. Uh, so, for example, if I have a, a in perfect uh, ideal gas, the pressure is rho t over mu. So if I write an expression for d log p in terms of d log t, d log rho, and d log mu, uh, these two, chi t and chi rho, are just one, and the chi mu is minus one, because there was a, a one over mu there. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so the subtlety comes in that in... The previous description, I didn't really worry about whether the composition of the material was changing with height. But if the mean molecular weight varies with height, and that's very common in stars, because I'm undergoing nuclear fusion in the bottom, so I'm making, taking hydrogen and making elements with higher masses per particle, um, that means that the mu tends to be, the mean molecular weight tends to be larger in the center of the star. Say, if I've converted it to helium, then mu is four-thirds, whereas the sort of solar mixture of 75% hydrogen, 25% helium by mass, mu is 0.6. So in the center of the star, which is finished fusing the hydrogen, the mo mean molecular weight is twice as high in the center as it is in the outer parts of the star. So <clears throat> there's a substantial gradient in this mean molecular weight. And... <clears throat> then that gradient in the mean molecular weight by itself can stabilize things. So the new criterion for stability of con convection is that the, this <coughs> uh, gradient, d log t, d log p, um, if that's larger than the adiabatic gradient <coughs> minus this ratio of chi's times chi mu, then I should be, <coughs> should be stable. Uh, and you can see that this term, because typically this chi mu is negative, this term is positive. So this is a stabilizing influence on the convection. On the other hand, if it were convective, then I would be mixing the material. So chi mu would be zero. So if it's not convecting, it's stable. But if it were convecting, it could be unstable. So there's this funny region that you can be where you're in between these two, the gradient is in between the two, and if it were convecting, it would be convectively unstable, and if it weren't convecting, it would be stable. And you can ask what happens. And, <coughs> uh, and what typically happens is, <coughs> uh, this is the same thing that happens if you have hot, salty water in an iceberg melting on top, putting cold, fresh water on top, then you can diffuse the heat much faster than you can diffuse particles. And so you get the so-called layering instability. The more spectacular, so that's what happens in stars, the more spectacular case is when you have hot, salty water on top of cold, dense, fresh water, and then you get famous salt fingers falling down as you diffuse the heat out of them. Uh, but that's not what happens in stars here. It's the, the other way around of uh, <coughs> hot, salty water with cold, fresh water on top, stabilized temporarily. Okay. Um, <coughs> 
So let's just consider the temperature gradient that we need for purely radiative equilibrium. So suppose we wanted to make a star which nowhere had any convection, then the maximum ratio of luminosity to mass it could have if the adiabatic gradient was say 0 0.4, just an ideal gas, uh, is given by this <coughs> factor. And you notice that there's a 1 over kappa here, uh, and there's luminosity to mass ratio. So you begin to suspect that the star is going to be convective either when the opacity is very large, which happens in the cool outer envelopes of stars, red giants, for example, or in low mass stars, much less massive than the sun. Um, <clears throat> in this expression, I assume the adiabatic gradient was uh, 0.4 for the monatomic ideal gas. If I have a gas which is partially ionized, then I can put enormous amounts of heat into it, and all that happens is that it gets more ionized. Um, so the temperature remains nearly constant <clears throat> as I vary the pressure enormously in those regions, which tends to extend these regions by lowering the adiabatic gradient. And the other place that you might expect to have instability is when the luminosity to mass ratio gets very large. And that happens in the cores of massive stars where I have those very temperature sensitive reactions, T to, T to the 17th, T to the 19th, T to the 40th. That means most of the luminosity is being generated in just a few percent of the mass of the star. So if the total star were uh, radiative and the core has the same luminosity but only a few percent as much mass. So this ratio is going to be say 30 times larger in the core than in the bulk of the star, and that can drive convection in the core. So indeed, if you look at stars that are more than about one and a half or twice the mass of the sun, depending on metallicity, their cores are convective and their outer parts are radiative. And stars like the sun, it's the other way around. The core is convective. It's not very essentially concentrated as we saw the PP reaction, but there's a cool envelope which is convective, and in low mass stars, the whole thing is completely convective. Okay, <clears throat> now part of the reason that stellar evolution is so complicated is <clears throat> that this beautiful sort of mathematical quasi-theorem very rarely applies in astrophysics. So if you had a homogeneous star where the, everything was all was completely mixed, if you specified its mass and you specified its chemical composition, then you could solve for its structure. Um, and unfortunately, you, real stars, after a while, they may start off sort of homogeneous, but after a while, the nuclear reactions are going on in the center. And if they're not convective all the way from the center to the surface, then they're not going to be chemically homogeneous, and therefore, the theorem doesn't apply. And that's why there's all these interesting phenomena like red giants and shells and so on. Um, so the principal thing that's driving the inhomogeneity is the nuclear reactions, of course, going on in the center. And things trying to maintain homogeneity, at least in the parts of the star or convection that we've talked about, uh, the semi-convection or thermohaline instability that I mentioned. And finally, possibility that <coughs> if I have a rotating star, I might have some kind of meridional circulation that will come back, which might on a slow time scale mix the star. Okay. <clears throat> so, just to introduce this famous diagram uh, for the physicists who haven't seen it before. So, astronomers like to plot things backwards, so low temperature is on this side and high temperature is on that side. This is convention. Um, <clears throat> this is luminosity. This plot goes from 10 to the minus 5 solar luminosities to 10 to the plus 5 solar luminosities. So, there's a factor of 10 to the 10 in luminosity of stars that we know about. The temperature, this is the temperature at the surface of the star, not the center. It ranges from about 3,000 degrees to 50,000 degrees and up. <clears throat> um, and this sequence along here, the so-called main sequence, is just the a function of mass. So the, basically, these are the homogeneous stars as they're initially born, and they start fusing hydrogen in the center. And the luminosity is a very strong function of the mass, so these down here are one or two tenths of a solar mass, and up here are 30 to 50 solar mass stars, and the sun is sitting here sort of in, in the middle. Um, so this portion is <clears throat> all the stars are roughly uh, similar compositions, but 
as they start fusing hydrogen in their centers and eventually become mostly helium in the center, then there's no longer a source of fuel and they have to reconfigure themselves. And they do that by contracting the core, heating it up so that they can start to fuse, uh, <clears throat> fuse hydrogen in a uh, shell around the exhausted region. And they then start to evolve up the red giant branch. And eventually they get to a point where they have to run out of, can't even sustain a thin hydrogen burning shell and have to begin burning helium in the core. Uh, if they're sufficiently massive, the helium burning just begins gradually. In the case of stars like the sun, it begins rather suddenly. So a star like the sun in that diagram, so this is the same diagram, temperature, luminosity, the star like the sun follows the track something like this, going up the giant branch, burning hydrogen in its center, and then burning hydrogen in shells around the uh, helium core, which is not burning, until the helium core gets massive enough that it can ignite helium in the center. Then it burns helium in the center, sort of helium main sequence for a while until it starts to exhaust helium in the center. And then it starts helium shell burning and there's a thin shell, there's all kinds of excitement that we'll get to later that happens up here of flashes of unstable <coughs> helium burning in the shell. And then once it can no longer maintain shell burning in helium, the star like the sun just gradually um, <coughs> cools down and becomes a white dwarf supported by electron degeneracy pressure with no more nuclear reactions. Now, <clears throat> There's one other thing which turns out to be uh, quite important in stars, which is that so far I've been talking as if all the stars, if it was born with the mass, it ended up with the same mass, and that almost never is true. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason is, particularly in the late evolution of the stars, the, the envelope swells up so that it's very weakly bound, and <clears throat> it doesn't take very much to remove that envelope. There's several things that can do. One is the envelope can become so cool that <clears throat> um, molecules and dust begin to form in it and the radiation pressure on those can expel them, dragging the gas with them. Uh, that's what happens in the late stages of the evolution of stars like the sun, for example. On more massive stars, the radiation pressure on the partly ionized matter in the outer envelope can blow it off and stellar winds. And we see that massive stars have strong winds. Um, I mentioned the waves can dis shock in the envelope and drive the envelope off. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps the most important thing to realize is if you look at these diagrams, the, so these lines are constant radius, so you see the stars are swelling up by something like a factor of a thousand in radius, so the binding energy, the escape velocity from the sun is like 600 kilometers a second, the escape velocity from a Terminal AGB star is like two kilometers a second, so it doesn't take much to get things off. Um, <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> in the more massive, <clears throat> more massive stars, the outer parts of the envelope uh, <clears throat> can even have a higher opacity than the interior, so that they're essentially <clears throat> uh, unbound. <clears throat> but because the luminosity of the star and the radius becomes so large that the amount of mass loss isn't actually very sensitive to the law, you say. If you say that the mass loss goes as the, some number times the luminosity to some power, the luminosity increases so much during the late stages that no matter essentially what parameters you put in front of it, you just end up losing most of the outer envelope of the star. Okay, so what is the evidence for that? Well, the most beautiful evidence for that is if I look at a cluster of stars, so all the stars are born at about the same time, and I look at the stars <clears throat> which are just leaving the main, so remember a star like the sun spends 10 to the 10 years here, spends about 10 to the seven years going up here, so one one thousandth the time it spends here, it spends around 10 to the eighth years here, so one one hundredth the time it's spent here, then spends a few million years going up here. So, <clears throat> and then another few hundred thousand years going over here and down to a white dwarf. So, <clears throat> if I compare the stars that are here to the stars which are, are the hot new white dwarfs, <clears throat> there's basically just a couple 10 to the eighth years difference <clears throat> in their, the time that I would need to start them, which means I have to change the mass maybe by one percent 
in order to change the evolution time from 10 to the 10 years to 10 to the 10 years minus a couple 10 to the 8th years. So a couple percent change in the mass is enough to make the difference between a star which is here and a star which has done all of that. Just need to change the mass by a couple hundredths. Okay, so <clears throat> that means that if I have some relationship, if I measure the mass of these stars and I measure the mass of the white dwarves, these are almost the progenitors of these. Maybe they had to be a little couple percent more massive. Okay, so if you do that, <clears throat> you measure the, you look at star clusters of different ages, so that turnoff point corresponds to different mass stars, so stars of say six solar masses would be a cluster that's maybe 10 to the seven years old, something over here would be one that's a few 10 to the eighth years old, something over here would be one that's a few billion years old. So by looking at different turnoffs, I can measure the masses of the stars which are just finishing their main sequence evolution, and then I can compare that to the masses of the young white dwarves in the cluster. And the expression is that the final mass of the white dwarf is 0.4 solar masses plus 0.1 times the initial mass. So you'll see if I go out here to eight solar masses, it ends up as a 1.3 solar mass white dwarf. The other 6.7 solar masses were blown out. If I go over here to around four, it's about a 0.8 solar mass white dwarf, and all the other 3.2 solar masses disappeared. And if I look at a star, something like the sun, it's going to end up as something like a half solar mass white dwarf, will have lost half of its mass. And <clears throat> so this shows the percentage of mass loss, so it sort of asymptotes to around 80% of the mass being lost, and sort of 40 or 50% of the mass is lost for solar type stars. Mm. Now, <clears throat> that makes it uh, rather distressing if I continue this uh, up to very high masses. Of course, for high masses, <clears throat> the lifetimes are all so short, and we don't have nice hot white dwarfs that we can measure the masses of spectroscopically. We have neutron stars or black holes, and if we're spe specifically interested in black holes, we don't actually have any black holes and clusters to measure, so we can't perform that experiment. But applying those same sort of wind prescriptions, people have made stellar models, and this shows the mass of the helium core at the time of the uh, final evolution when it gets to be the core becomes heat, uh, iron core and collapses. And this shows with sort of typical wind prescriptions and solar metallicity how the mass of the core depends on the initial mass, and you see that it rises up to about at 40 solar masses, the core is 14 solar masses, but then it drops catastrophically. So even if I go to 100 solar mass stars, I ended up with only a six solar mass helium core, and all the rest of the stars have been blown out, basically. It's the wind prescriptions. So if I wanted to make 30 solar mass black holes for LIGO, you'll see this topped out at 14. So then, well, you have to say, well, I have to change the wind prescription so I don't lose all this mass if I want to make a 30 solar mass black hole. So if you make the black hole, say, one one-hundredth of solar and then apply the same wind prescriptions, you see you can get much larger masses. But unfortunately, this is all playing with wind prescriptions. This is not unlike these. Those were directly from the observations that tell us what the answer is. These are <coughs> sort of guesses at how the wind behaves. Okay, so just to show you that all that stuff really actually happens, uh, here's a picture of the globular cluster M15. You will see that all the stars that you see here are about 0.8 solar masses, the ones that you can see in the picture. And you'll see that they're not chemically homogeneous. They're not all identical. There's some which are faint, so those are the main sequence stars. There's some which are red. Those are the red giants and asymptotic giant branch stars. And then there's some blue ones, and those are the ones which are burning helium in their cores. Um, <clears throat> and this cluster is uh, one of my favorite clusters, partly because not only does it contain all the stars, it actually contains a planetary nebula, which is the phase just after the white dwarf is formed, and it's illuminating the gas that was blown out in the late, late stages of the AGB. <clears throat> uh, when it was <clears throat> had this giant envelope that was being blown out in the wind, because now there's a hot white dwarf in the center ionizing it, so you can see that 
there clearly is a hot white dwarf. Um, <clears throat> and this also contains two X-ray binaries, so that's two neutron stars accreting from companions, which have been captured into binary systems around it. And it contains eight more neutron stars in the form of radio pulsars, one of which is probably actually two neutron stars because it's a pair orbiting, and that pair is going to merge in about two by ten to the eighth years, making a LIGO source for our descendants. An extremely bright LIGO source for our descendants. <clears throat> so 10 kiloparsecs away. Okay, uh, so this is a different globular cluster. I couldn't find one of M15 because it's rather far away, so the data aren't so pretty. Um, <clears throat> but this shows the main sequence, then the red giant branch. There's a little jog in the red giant branch. Uh, then <clears throat> after it gets to here, this is the point where the core of the red giant gets uh, dense and hot enough that it ignites helium in the center. Then it burns helium in the core along this track. And the parameter that varies along here is how much of the envelope got blown out as it was going up this track. So this is just changing the amount of envelope. Otherwise, they're all basically core helium burning stars. Um, and then after they've exhausted helium in the center and then they start helium shell burning, they go up the track again and then come down and make a white dwarf. Okay, uh, there's this wonderful diagram. I thought this, this is time for some light entertainment. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of astronomers. So this plots, uh, again, in the usual negative way, okay, increasing this direction is the number of paper, refereed papers in ADS. Um, and this is the number of Google hits on the name. Okay, so you can think uh, this is sort of actual work and this is perceived popularity. So <laughs> up here he actually forgot Brian May, who I looked up. So he's 35 million Google hits and two papers. Uh, he's the lead guitarist of Queen, you might have heard of him. But he has a PhD in astrophysics. Um, <clears throat> and uh, up here, you know, there's Carl Sagan, respectable number of papers, but an amazing number of Google hits. Uh, my supervisor, Lord Martin Rees. And <clears throat> Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, these are Google UK hits, so some of them are rather peculiar. I didn't know who Mylene Class was, but she's apparently some model TV personality, amateur astronomer, so she has zero papers, but a lot of Google hits. He put her in for some reason. Then, you know, there's Wendy Friedman and Sandy Faber, you know, sort of along the main sequence of more Google hits with papers. Uh, you know, there's people like Simon White who actually have a huge number of papers but are not so visible. Those are the, you know, the, the astronomer's astronomer. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, these are the dark astronomers working hard but nobody cares about it. <laughs> um, these are the ones with, you know, <clears throat> with, the, with the Twitter accounts, right? <clears throat> okay, so you can all go back and plot yourself on this diagram after it's a little bit of work. <clears throat> Uh, so I was uh, in the middle of the main sequence, I would say. <clears throat> I have not yet evolved up into the new media branch, fortunately. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so I just thought I'd show a couple of little... Uh, <clears throat> so this shows the... Is that going? Yeah. This, sort of, this shows the evolution of... 0.9 to 2 solar mass stars, so you see that the more massive ones evolve very quickly, and the less massive ones are still sitting on the main sequence, while the more massive ones have already finished the AGB and made themselves white dwarves. So this is the white dwarf sequence. And you see that <clears throat> the 0.9 solar mass stars are still waiting you know, 10 billion years to get their evolution going, while the two solar mass stars would finish their evolution in a couple 10 to the 8th years. One's a little boring. So let's do the same thing. This one covers one to eight. So again, you can see the eight solar mass stars go really rapidly, make massive white dwarves, <clears throat> uh, while the poor sun is sitting there waiting for something to happen as it takes a really long time for its uh, <clears throat> core hydrogen to exhaust. <clears throat> Maybe we'll skip waiting for the sun here. <clears throat> 
so th this, so in this case, they're basically, if you remember the initial mass, final mass relation, over this range, you're basically going from 0.51 to 0.55 solar mass white dwarfs. Mm -hmm. So they're basically all the same radius. Whereas over here, 1 to 8, you're sort of going from 0.5 to 1.3. So there's a huge difference in the white dwarf radius. And because this is rather sparse, uh, <clears throat> the white dwarfs from the sun are um, much larger radius than the high mass white dwarfs that came from the eight solar mass stars. So at a given temperature, a factor of 10 in the radius is a factor of 100 in the luminosity. <clears throat> so these are the big white dwarfs, and these are this one. I think this one should have come from that one, the very small white dwarf. Okay, <clears throat> and so this is, shows three and 15 solar mass star. And so the 15 solar mass star just went straight across, no shell burning, no giant branch. Uh, this one, the mass loss was chosen in the <clears throat> semiconvection chosen, so it di didn't have a blue, blue blue swing, it just went supernova at the end of its life, while the three solar mass star is still chugging along. <clears throat> okay. So. Hmm. This is not rats. <clears throat> There's a beautiful colored background on that slide, believe it or not, which shows colored contours of the opacity. Oh, okay, yeah, so this, yeah, so look at the Look at those screens, not the, not the projector. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> on, on, well, I guess I'll, I'll point, look over, <laughs> what, what's the best way of doing this? Sorry, I'll point over here. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so this line is radiation pressure equals gas pressure. So this is a, <clears throat> a line of rho T equals T to the fourth. So rho is T cubed along this line. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, you'll see that the contours of constant opacity are nearly parallel to this line. And that's the fact that this is rho goes as t cubed. If you remember the Kramer's opacity, that was rho goes as t to the 3.5. So that's why these are nearly parallel. And you'll notice that here the opacity is just electron scattering. So it's about uh, 0.4 centimeters squared per gram. Here is several hundred centimeters square per gram. Here is 10 to the 4 centimeters square per gram. So the opacity increases by a factor of 10 to the 4 across here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> once I get to temperatures up above several 10 to the 8, I start to create photon photons, can create electron positrons from the tail of the black body distribution. Uh, so I start to have electron positron pairs. Over here is sort of surfaces of stars where I have molecules and things becoming ionized and up here the density is so high that here this is the boundary between non-degenerate gas and one where degeneracy pressure the electron dominates it at sufficiently high density and the higher the temperature the higher the density I have to get to before I'm fully degenerate. <clears throat> okay so if I now take a look at the, what the interiors of some stars look like so here's the surface of the sun and the center of the sun if I wait till the sun is a red giant, then the surface of the sun gets cooler and puffier. Okay, so the density gets, <clears throat> gets lower and the temperature gets lower. So I move the surface from here to here. But the center of the sun and the red giant, I have to get, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, the center has gotten very much denser. It's basically this almost degenerate ball of helium with a burning shell around it. So it's got hotter. Uh, because I have to maintain the hydrogen burning temperature at the edge of the shell, so the center is very hot and dense. So the star has gotten denser and hotter in the center and cooler and fluffier at the outside, sort of going in the opposite direction. Uh, if I look at, say, a 25 solar mass star, sort of its endpoints when it's on the main sequencer here, and when it's a red supergiant, you can see that again it gets much. <coughs> uh, lower temperature and much hotter and denser at the center. Now, if I superpose <coughs> uh, those tracks, I'll see, I guess most of you are on this side. This is superposing the tracks on the, <coughs> on the diagram. You can see that this, uh, both 
<clears throat> the red giant and the massive star are all roughly following this line, radiation pressure comparable to gas pressure. That's sort of warning you they're all close to the Eddington limit. Radiation pressure equals gas pressure. And you notice that all of those, the inner, in middle parts of the stars are in the uh, electron scattering dominated region, but the sun is out here in this region of high opacity. That's why the outer parts of the sun are convective, because the opacity is so high out here. Um, <clears throat> and you notice that the center of the one solar mass red giant star is way up here in the degenerate region. So as it's a red giant, it's burning hydrogen in a shell, but the rest of it is basically degenerate white dwarf already. It just has a hot shell around it. So the center of the red giant is very degenerate. But you'll notice that the center of the 25 solar mass star is not really very degenerate yet. It still has room to continuously ignite things. It doesn't have to have a uh, shell burning yet. Okay, so <clears throat> we can now uh, look at the <clears throat> evolution <clears throat> of the tracks of the center of the star. So unfortunately, this diagram has density in this direction and temperature in that. So it's 45 degree flip from the ones I was showing you before. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, the degenerate region is then high density. Uh, <clears throat> so for a given temperature, there's a high density, so there's degenerate electrons are on this side. Uh, so a white dwarf, <clears throat> say a half solar mass white dwarf would be somewhere over here with <clears throat> negligible temperature and high density. <clears throat> um, so if I start the star that's say less than <clears throat> uh, two solar masses, then <clears throat> uh, once it's exhausted hydrogen in the center, the hydrogen burning shell and the red giant um, <clears throat> becomes partly degenerate, so there's an isothermal helium core. And <clears throat> once that core gets more massive than about 0.45 solar masses, then it's able to ignite helium in the center, so there's a flash to ignite core helium burning. And above two solar masses, <clears throat> the core temperature ignites the he helium non-degenerately, so that there's never a flash, it just transitions from hydrogen burning Slowly the core contracts and gets hotter and begins helium burning. Okay, so this shows the <clears throat> evolution of a, a three solar mass star, a little bit more massive. Um, <clears throat> so the blue regions are the convection zones. So you remember I told you that massive stars were convective in the center and radiative in the outer parts. So this is the core convection zone. The center half solar mass or so is convective. Uh, and so that it gradually shrinks a little bit as it evolves and exhausts uh, the mean molecular weight starts to increase as I build up helium in the center. <coughs> and at this point, <coughs> it's getting less and less hydrogen and more and more helium in the center of the star. Uh, <coughs> at this point, <coughs> I have the helium flash and I start uh, with a very concentrated central region of helium burning in the center, so it now becomes convective in the center because the helium, remember the triple alpha reaction is going like T to the 40th, so there's a very centrally concentrated helium burning that makes a convective region. And the outer parts of the star become convective because it's starting as a, <coughs> as a red giant. And <coughs> at this point, <coughs> uh, it makes the transition that in addition to the <coughs> uh, convective <coughs> convective core, uh, there's, there's this red region is the <coughs> uh, region where I start to have a shell burning. So in this region, <coughs> I'm now burning helium in a shell outside a carbon oxygen core. So this region here was helium, now here it becomes carbon oxygen with helium burning in a shell, and just outside that helium burning shell is a hydrogen burning shell. So I have a convective envelope, it's mostly hydrogen. There's a thin, hot region which is fusing hydrogen to helium. Then as that helium layer builds up, eventually it becomes dense enough that the helium can fuse. But <clears throat> there's a problem when I have a thin layer of helium burning which is that, remember, the helium burning is incredibly temperature sensitive, it's like T to the 40th. So if I have a little spike in the temperature, the reaction rate goes way up. 
but if I have a thin shell, the weight of the material on top of it is independent of the thickness of the shell. Right? It's just the weight of the whole star. If I have a spherical star and I double the radius, then I change the weight of the material on top. But if it's a plain parallel sheet, the weight of the material on top is just the weight of the column above it. So now imagine that I increase the temperature a little bit then the reaction rate is going to go up like t to the 40th. So I'm putting a lot of energy in there, which would like to lift the shell up, but the pressure on top of it has remained fixed. So the reaction rate just keeps climbing up and up and up. And so I get flashes of helium burning. And so this is a zoom in to that region that I was showing before, which shows that in fact there are a whole series of these helium explosions. Each one of these spikes is a helium explosion, which bursts the core out, there's a huge red giant on top of that. So th even though the luminosity in this helium burning shell goes up by a factor of several thousand in a few years in this spike, the luminosity at the surface of the star just changes by 25% or something. So <clears throat> it's a huge exciting explosion if you were living inside the star, but at the surface it's, it's a modest thing that sort of swells up the star for a little bit for a few thousand years and then it contracts again. <clears throat> but there's this whole series of thermal pulses, uh, so-called, uh, which go... Yeah, well, the duration of each pulse is about a year or a couple of years. The time it takes for the heat to diffuse out to the surface is about a thousand years. So the time scale for the star itself to expand and contract is sort of a thousand years. The pulse itself is, is of order a couple of years. <coughs> okay, um, <coughs> so <coughs> for stars that are less than about two solar masses, the hydrogen burning shell and the red giant um, that's left behind is partly degenerate. And as I said, that it ignites uh, when it gets to about 0.45 solar masses, it ignites uh, the core helium burning. For stars that are more than two solar masses, ignite non-degenerately. If I get more than about six solar masses, <coughs> then that carbon oxygen core that was left behind, so this is all fused helium, so this is carbon oxygen here. So in this star, if it's three solar masses, it ends up with a little over 0.6 solar masses. But if I went up to a six solar mass star, now the core is about one solar mass of CO, and it's so hot and dense that it can actually ignite carbon burning, and the carbon can fuse leaving oxygen, neon, magnesium. So it's thought that white dwarfs that are more than about one solar mass will be no longer CO white dwarfs, but oxygen, neon, magnesium, although the boundary is a bit fuzzy, maybe it's 1.1, something like that. Um, if I get to eight or nine solar mass stars, that oxygen, neon, magnesium core, um, <clears throat> it grows to about 1.3 solar masses and is degenerate and it's now so dense at 1.3 solar masses um, <clears throat> that the, uh, the Fermi energy of the electrons is larger than the uh, energy differences between nuclei and so I start to electron capture. So electrons start to be captured into the nuclei. When that happens, of course, I convert <coughs> uh, protons into neutrons. I remove an electron from the system. And since the electrons were providing the pressure which supported this, this core, when I remove the electrons, now the core begins to collapse. Okay, so that's this line, somewhere around eight or nine solar masses. So I begin to collapse because this 1.3 solar mass white dwarf in the center of the star starts to undergo beta capture, loses pressure, and the core collapses. And that's the so-called electron capture supernova that we think happens between stars of eight or nine solar masses and about 12 solar masses. Okay, um, <clears throat> now if I go up to even higher masses, say about 13 solar masses, then <clears throat> the core that I build up <clears throat> Uh, is hot enough and not so degenerate as it was for the lower mass stars that the oxygen and magnesium begins to fuse into silicon, which almost immediately then fuses into iron. And so I start for the stars more than about 12 or 13 solar masses, I start to build an iron core in the center of them. And as that core grows beyond the maximum mass, 
So the core is hot, so it's not the usual 1.4 solar mass tundra Sakar mass, but there's a thermal correction due to the fact it's not completely degenerate, but there's some pressure support. So the actual sort of thermal chandra Sikar limit is around 1.4 or 2 solar masses. But as this iron core grows beyond that maximum stable mass, uh, <clears throat> then it can no longer, there's no stable solution for a white dwarf, even a hot white dwarf at that temperature. Uh, so it begins to collapse. That increases the density and also to some extent the temperature. But unfortunately, there are now no nuclear reactions that will release energy. If I fuse iron to heavier elements, it actually absorbs energy rather than liberates energy because iron and nickel are the most tightly bound, <coughs> tightly bound nuclei. So there's no exothermal reactions, but the density is going up, so there are huge neutrino losses. So the core is busily losing energy. It can no longer create any energy, and so it just begins to collapse eventually supersonically. So the center of this iron core, the inner half of it roughly collapses supersonically until it reaches a few times nuclear density. And then nuclear strong interactions are very repulsive, so it bounces. So the core bounces out. So it sends the, sh the outer part of the core is still falling in. The inner part that collapsed homologously bounces back out again. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's a shock wave that develops between the infalling outer core and the bouncing inner core. Um, and that <clears throat> shock wave begins to propagate, propagate outwards. But as it's going out, it's going through all this infalling iron. And it's very hot behind the shock, so it begins to photo dissociate the iron, which takes energy away from the shock. So uh, initially, in the 1960s, people thought, oh, great, we'll just bounce the star off, and then it will bounce off, and that'll blow up and make a supernova. But no, that's not what happens. The shock goes out. There's the infalling material. It loses energy to the photo dissociation, continuing neutrino losses, and the shock just stalls. Um, <clears throat> so to make successful supernovae, uh, people think that the way to do it is that the binding energy of this collapsed core is around gravitational binding energy is about 310 to the 53 ergs. So if I could get even a, a order of percent of that energy, that would be enough to, if I could couple 1% of the new energy of the neutrinos streaming out through the shock to the matter in the shock, then that would be enough energy to restart the shock and make it go out. And <clears throat> In 1D, that typically doesn't happen, but in 3D simulations, uh, um, <clears throat> it appears that the shocks can be re-energized, and certainly in nature, we actually do see supernovae, so we think clearly shock waves somehow get re-energized and propagate out, and that's the story of the core collapse supernova explosion up here. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so... I would say, th when I was young, the idea was that they just blew themselves up. I would say that now I think most people think that they make neutron stars, and they maybe make neutron stars with very low kicks, at least some of them, which is something we desperately need to do. Are these the same neutron star as the one that are forming the core collapse supernova, or is there some differences? Um, again, there, in both cases, the estimates of the Reliable estimates of the masses are hard to come by. I would say, you know, there's, there, I'll show you in later in you know, the current best estimates. There's actually a range of masses that can be produced here. There's also a range here. They probably are shifted a little, shifted somewhat. Um, there's popular lore that these have much lower kicks because there's <coughs> uh, than these because you're not <coughs> coupling. Is 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 much it's much less violent than your and. You don't, the, the core that collapses is not so anisotropic, so maybe the anisotropy in the neutrino emission is different. But I would say it's not complete. There certainly are two populations of neutron stars, high and low velocity. Whether that's completely the difference, I would say, is less clear. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this is just to sort of show you. So this is a, a life cycle of a 13 solar mass star, the last thousand years of its life. So this is log of the time until it blows up. Here's one year before it blows up, a thousand years below it before it blows up, and a few hours before it blows up. <clears throat> and so the main sequence is way over here at 6 or 6.5 or something. So this has already evolved. So <clears throat> uh, this 
this region is the helium burning shell. Uh, <clears throat> these are three successive carbon burning shells. It starts core carbon burning and then carbon burning in a shell. Then <clears throat> there's oxygen burning, oxygen burning in a shell. And <clears throat> finally in the, <clears throat> in the last, uh, <coughs> In the last stage, uh, there's, this is central silicon burning, which starts in sort of a couple of days before the end. Mm. Oops. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Sorry, what do you mean by interior mass here? Sorry? What do you mean by interior so, mass? So, this is, so th this is a plot of, so th this is color, co the, this, the color code, Color coding is by whether there's energy generation or energy loss. So blue is losing energy than neutrinos, plasma neutrinos and pair neutrinos. Red is nuclear reactions. The hatched region is convection. And this is just at a given time as I go out in the star from zero solar masses to one solar mass, two solar mass, three solar masses, and a 13 solar mass star. So this is just showing the inner 4.5 solar masses of whatever's left of 13 solar masses. It's probably not 13 solar masses because there would have been wind, but mm. um, <clears throat> so this is just M of R, basically, just Lagrangian mass coordinate, and then as a function of time. So in other words, the y-axis is positioned inside the star? In, uh, in, terms, in terms of mass, mass right? measured from the center. What, what do we mean by these hatched uh, areas? This is convection. So if it's not hatched, it's from the heat conduction is by radiation. If it's attached, it's convective. So you can see typically in these thin shells, there's a huge temperature gradient. And so there's a convection region attached on top of each one of them, for example. And then up here, there's the convective envelope of, of the star. What is neon though? I'm sorry? Neon? Uh, I think they didn't separately show it. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, somewhere buried in there. But yeah. <coughs> not, I'm not sure. I, I didn't go back and identify all of this. <clears throat> I know this is carbon, oxygen, silicon, but probably neon somewhere in there. Uh, yeah. So why are the hatched the bottom Oh, this is, it's the other way around. This is, there's, so here I ignite, <clears throat> uh, for example, carbon burning in the center. Now, in a, this, it's completely, there's convection zone. So all of this region burns carbon to oxygen and it's completely homo basically homogeneous here because it's being mixed so after <clears throat> it finishes burning this region is now oxygen and if i want to burn oxygen i would have to get a much hotter and denser core so instead of starting to burn oxygen what actually happens is i get a shell which becomes hot enough to burn the remaining carbon outside but now that's a very vigorous hot flame, so it excites convection above it, sort of like above a candle, there's a convection flame, which then mixes all of this region in. So now all of this has become oxygen, and now I do the same thing again. Okay, and then once I get to this stage, then finally it's gotten hot enough that I can start to burn the oxygen in the center, and then that gets a convection zone, and again I get the same stair step. <clears throat> now, these whole sequences of interacting stair steps are rather sensitive to the mass of the star, right? So if I did 13 solar masses, 15, 16, 17, you know, the ordering of these steps and how much the convection zones can move around. And so you end up with rather <clears throat> uh, complicated patterns, which were first noticed in this paper by O'Connor and Ott. Um, <clears throat> so these are different people's stellar models as a function of stellar mass. And <clears throat> the parameter which they identified, they define this parameter xi 2.5, which is you go out 2.5 solar masses in the star, and you calculate the gravitational potential at that point, so m over r at that point. And if m over r <clears throat> uh, is very large, so small radius compact, then <clears throat> they, at 2.5 solar masses is more than roughly the maximum mass of a neutron star. So if 2.5 solar masses is too compact, you can't absorb enough neutrino energy to make a successful explosion. 
So they said that if psi 2.5 is greater than 0.45, they colored it black and said those are going to end up as black holes. And if it's less than 0.45, they colored it blue and said those will be successive supernova explosions. And you'll notice, well, you know, these guys' models, they never make any black holes. Right? They were somehow puffy. But pretty much every, most people ended up, there was this little band where you made black holes, but then you made neutron stars again, and then you made black holes. And this has been done uh, just uh, last month. It came out a new paper by so-called Woosley and Hager, where they did this to death, running you know, 16,000 stellar models with five different mass loss rates, and all color-coded here. And this shows this psi 2.5 as a function of mass, and there are different color codes depending on how much they change the mass loss rate from the standard one to half that to a tenth that. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but you can see that here's this little bump. So here are the 20 solar mass stars that make black holes, and here's the more than 25 solar mass stars that make black holes, except maybe these make a few neutron stars or something. Um, <clears throat> And here, answer your question, so here's, if you calculate the, the sort of prescriptions for estimating how much material uh, falls back <coughs> into the uh, neutron star, they have two prescriptions, one by Muller and one by Elfel. Um, <coughs> and this shows the mass of the, the gravitational mass, so for some particular equation of state they use to convert baryonic mass to gravitational mass of the neutron stars as a function of the initial mass of the star. And you can see that they can get everything from about 1.2 solar masses up to 1.7, and even in some cases of two solar mass neutron stars, they had enough fallback. <clears throat> so that was the sort of successful explosions, the Xi less than 0.45. And for the Xi is greater than 0.45, here are the black holes. Um, <clears throat> so these they renormalized so that the height of the bump depends on how many stars there were in the initial mass function. Um, and this is if the whole star minus the wind went in, and this is if you just count the helium core. So if you put a spectacular wind, or you had it in a close binary where you sort of stripped off all the mass, so you could think of this, these would be black holes in binaries, and these would be single black holes that didn't have very much wind. And you can see the single black holes that end up between about 11 and 17 solar masses, and the, the ones in binaries between about 4 and 8 solar masses. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Show that this is a spectacular failure in explaining the physics of compact objects. Because if you look at the neutron star, the mass function quite concentrated on 1.4, and this predicts a huge scatter. I would say, yeah, I would say, I mean, there, there certainly are, I mean, we know lots of neutron stars in this range, but we think they go, they're all in systems that have accreted, and we think they got the extra mass from their companions. For the ones which just have the neutron star, it's absolutely correct. They're all piled up here. And I would say this is, <clears throat> they, didn't, they didn't really have a lot of discussion about that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I would, one thing to remember is this is with a particular equation of state. Of course, what they actually predict is the baryon mass. So you're free to move. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, it can move. <coughs> but it would help. It would help to move it down, certainly. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, and the and the black holes, I would say, you know, it's also maybe not a great success. I would, you know, think there's some uh, in binaries a bit farther upstream. So, I think the black holes need to move one way, and the neutron stars need to move the other at the moment. Okay. So, <coughs> uh, that's sort of the. Uh, standard part, so those of you that took a course in stellar evolution, now you can wake up. This is the part which is sort of the, the current frontiers. <coughs> um, <coughs> so <coughs> I'll, I'll just sort of highlight three areas that have uh, been site of a lot of activity in the last few years. Uh, <coughs> so one of them is if I consider a massive star, in the inner parts of the star, everything is completely ionized. The opacity is electron scattering opacity, 0.4 centimeters squared per gram if it's hydrogen, 0.2 if it's helium. Um, <clears throat> but as I go out in the star, some of the material starts to recombine. 
And so there are electrons bound in the atoms, and in particular iron has a whole lot of electrons that it holds on to quite tightly in X-ray energies. And so at temperatures around 10 to the 6 degrees, there's sort of typically a large bump in the opacity where the opacity gets to two or three times the electron scattering opacity. So if the inner part of the star is happily Eddington limited, <coughs> so mass, the uh, luminosity to mass ratio given by the Eddington limit, and it then reaches a part of the star where the opacity is now two or three times larger, the opacity the luminosity is locally larger than the Eddington limit. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the radiation pressure is, exceeds the gravity pulling it in. So if you insist that you have an equilibrium stellar model, the stellar model can find a solution to that problem, which doesn't involve blowing anything out. It just reverses the pressure gradient, so the pressure and density begin to increase outwards, so that there's pushing in holding your star together. So the model happily does that. Okay, so it solves the hydrostatic and radiative equilibrium. So there's the <coughs> kappa. So if I take the ratio, so here's this famous ratio, L over L Eddington. There's the kappa times L, but <coughs> the actual thing has the actual kappa. And, <coughs> and <coughs> of course, there's L of R. There's a convective piece. If it's rotating, then it shouldn't even quite be one, you have to reduce the potential. Um, <clears throat> and here's what happens to the stars. So <clears throat> oh, these are some calculations for 15 solar mass stars. If they have hardly any iron in them, uh, so, sorry, hardly any iron in them, then the stars look pretty normal. But if you make solar abundances, <clears throat> the 15 solar mass star looks pretty normal. But the 24 solar mass star, which is closer to the Eddington limit in its interior, and super Eddington and the iron bump, well, it develops this huge envelope <coughs> with, notice, an inverted density profile. The outer part of the star is denser than the inner part of the envelope. Seems a little unphysical, right? But the way that's solving the Eddington problem by having the weight of this layer holding the rest of the star in. You might guess that if I did not have a model which insisted that it remain in equilibrium not moving, that another solution might be to have a wind. Okay. So the next thing to mention is that <clears throat> in those very late stages of burning, those last few days when they have the oxygen, well, I guess the last few weeks oxygen neon burning in the last day of silicon burning, uh, there's extremely vigorous convection in that core. Remember, the, this tiny little core is producing um, <clears throat> 10 to the 6 solar luminosities in photons, but it's actually producing more like 10 to the 12 solar luminosities in neutrinos, which are getting moved around uh, by convection. So there's a huge convective luminosity. And <clears throat> uh, in those convective motions are basically buoyant bubbles rising up and denser bubbles falling down. And <clears throat> those excite both acoustic waves. You all know that turbulence, if you stand behind a jet engine, it's very loud. It radiates acoustic radiation, but it also radiates gravity modes, so buoyancy modes inside these regions. Um, <clears throat> and those can propagate out inside the star. Um, <clears throat> so inside this oxygen burning core, there's vigorous convection, radiates gravity waves, and those gravity waves have to tunnel through, <clears throat> uh, tunnel through the region. So this is the sort of propagation diagram of the um, Lamb and Brunt Vesela frequencies. Uh, so it has to tunnel through a region, and it can convert the gravity waves to acoustic coupling to acoustic waves in the outer parts of the star, and <clears throat> uh, the luminosity in the waves that are radiated basically depends on the, as I said, the convective luminosity is much larger than the photon luminosity because most of that's being radiated in neutrinos eventually. Um, <clears throat> but you can get about 10 to the 8 solar luminosities radiated into these G modes, and about 10% of them can tunnel through and convert into acoustic waves in the outer part, and that would be 10 to the 7 solar luminosities in w acoustic waves coming out through the star.
but the photon luminosity is only 10 to the 6. It's the Eddington limit. So there's actually, well, there's order unit of the order of few fudge factors in here, but if it were 10 to the 7 in the acoustic waves, there would be 10 times more power in the waves than there is in photons, and those waves will steepen into shocks at the surface of the star and dump a huge amount of energy into the surface of the star and probably drive a wind. And <clears throat> this is one popular idea of a way of pushing a shell out from the star a few weeks before it explodes as a supernova so that the supernova ejected can run into a shell, which uh, you'll hear more about as time goes on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and the last one I wanted to mention is the question of rotational mixing. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I told you that there's this beautiful theorem that says that if I have a homogeneously mixed star, then its state is unique, unlike the inhomogeneous ones where sun-like stars can turn into red giants and AGB stars and everything. <clears throat> um, so if I had some other way of mixing stars, so convection won't do it because the convection zones are limited and the semi-convection extends it a little bit, but doesn't mix the whole star. Um, <clears throat> so if one wants to mix all of the stars, you need something else. So uh, one ancient thing which was proposed by Eddington in the 1920s is Eddington realized that if I have a rotating star, the effective potential in the rotating reference frame gets replaced by the usual gravitational potential minus the centripetal potential. Right, which varies with latitude. And <clears throat> if I try to set up an equilibrium star, then the pressure, the temperature, the density are all constant on equipotentials. And then if I write down the radiative diffusion equation with the pressure, the temperature, and the density constant on these equipotentials, and I take the divergence of the flux, it's not zero. Okay, now that's okay in the center of the star where the nuclear energy generation is going wrong, but it's not zero out in the envelope where there is no energy generation because of this rotation. So if the divergence of the flux isn't zero in this nice sort of cellular model of the star, then it can't be in equilibrium. So Eddington and Sweet proposed that the solution to that is that, well, if the divergence of the flux isn't zero, then I better be having some meridional motion that carries heat from the poles to the equator in order to make this add up to zero. So they said that <coughs> uh, this was basically canceled out by a transport of heat due to mer meridional circulation. And the this determined the velocity that I would need for the circulation. And if I take R divided by that velocity, that gives the characteristic circulation time which is basically the thermal time scale of the star, how long it takes the heat to leak out of the star, times the ratio of the Keplerian angular velocity, so breakup velocity, rotation velocity of the star, divided by its actual rotation velocity. So if the star is rotating close to breakup, then I can mix the material on a thermal time scale, which is much less than the nuclear time scale, so I could keep the star fairly uh, homogeneous. In the case of the sun, <coughs> omega is <coughs> about uh, less than a hundredth of omega Kepler, so this is 10 to the minus 4. So the circulation time for the sun is much longer than the lifetime of the sun, so it wouldn't make any effect on the evolution of the sun. It takes 10 to the 12 years to carry stuff from the pole to the equator, and the sun's finished its evolution in 10 to the 10 years. So there's so it's not mixing the sun, but for very rapidly rotating stars, in particular massive ones, and in particular massive ones, which maybe are low metallicity, so they have very weak winds because the winds will remove angular momentum and slow the stars down and wreck this rapid time scale. Uh, maybe this could work. <clears throat> okay, so if you do that, here's what happens if you basically plug this prescription with this velocity into MESA and do the mixing with those velocities. Uh, here's what happens. So if the rotation velocity, this is written as surface velocity. We think of this as omega over omega Kepler of <coughs> um, 0.2. So it's slowly rotating. Then the star evolves off towards low temperature and large radius, just like it does usually. But if I put in 0.5 so that this time scale is something like 
four times the thermal time scale and nicely net less than the nuclear time scale, then the circulation keeps the whole star mixed. And rather than the core becoming helium while the envelope is still hydrogen, the whole star just gradually becomes more and more and more helium rich. And it actually evolves off towards the blue, roughly constant radius, increasing, increasing luminosity, and increasing temperature. So it evolves in the opposite direction. And it doesn't swell up. OK, uh, so uh, enthusiasts of this idea point out that there are a few close binary stars in the large Magellanic Cloud, which is lower metallicity than the, the solar metallicity, which seem kind of blue for their ages. So maybe they're evolving that way. So they're in little clusters where the lower mass stars clearly have an age where these guys should have evolved off to this direction, but they're actually still blue, even though they're old. <coughs> Maybe they're not cluster members, it's just a few stars, but it's certainly a suggested bit of evidence. They're also in the LMC, the, the, more, the most rapidly rotating OB stars are enhanced in nitrogen. And nitrogen is a product of CNO burning, which when it's active in the cycle is enormously more abundant than it is in normal <coughs> uh, supernova ejecta. So that suggests that maybe these rapidly rotating stars actually do have a circulation pattern that's bringing CNO cycle material to the surface. Uh, and that's why they're nitrogen enriched. It's difficult to measure abundances in rapidly rotating massive stars. You can read the paper and decide for yourself. Uh, on the con side, uh, this beautiful circulation that Edmund and Sweet proposed does not actually conserve angular momentum, which seems like sort of an important thing to conserve. Um, this was pointed out by Schwarzschild already in 1947. Many other people have worked on this since then. And Garaud, for example, has a very elegant paper in which he points out that in the rapid rotation, he claims the solution is not Edmund and Sweet circulation, but it's basically a sort of geostrophic flow with a, some, only a very weak meridional circulation. So maybe it doesn't exist, and maybe there's some other explanation for this. Uh, <clears throat> but as I'm sure we'll hear more later, uh, rotational mixing is really, really popular for the last few years uh, because it makes a nice way of making LIGO's binary black holes. That If I have a close binary, they're tidally locked, so by definition they're rapidly rotating, nearly at breakup. Um, <clears throat> and if they were being mixed meridionally, then instead of swelling up as red giants, they just evolve at fixed radius. So I can start a close binary, and I can end up with a close binary helium core, and then I can end up with a pair of uh, supernovae or a collapse to two black holes. And I never have this swelling up to a thousand solar radii and the two stars buried inside each other and needing a common envelope. I just evolve them at fixed radius and end up with uh, uh, <clears throat> stars which are close enough to merge. And it also has the advantage that because I'm mixing, the whole star becomes a helium core. And you remember that diagram I showed you that you know, basically it was topping out at 14 solar masses and there were these winds removing everything. But now the whole star is getting made into the helium core and so it's much easier to get higher mass black holes. And <clears throat> a similar idea is very nice for long GRV models and so on. So it's very popular. Is it real? We don't know. Um, <clears throat> so let me just um, uh, conclude by saying so far we've talked about single stars. It's the easy case to start with. How relevant is it? Well, <clears throat> if you look, make a look at a sample. Sorry, this is 2014. No, 2012. Sorry, forget the four. Um, <clears throat> not that far in the future. Um, <clears throat> so if you like a popular uh, survey of massive star binaries, the ones which are either single or in such wide binaries that they will complete the revolution without interacting with their companion is a bit less than half of the stars. The other half, roughly half of them are close enough that <clears throat> as one star begins to evolve, it will dump its envelope onto the other star, removing the outer parts of its envelope. And the other half of them are so close, they're probably going to merge. Okay, so single star evolution, everything we've talked about, is basically relevant to a little bit less than half of all the stars that we know about. So that's binary stars. Now let's look at 
triples and higher more. So this shows the fraction of O stars that are single, 15%, two, 32%, six stars, binary orbiting a binary with the two more orbiting outside it. That's, for example, Castor, the bright star in Gemini, is actually six stars like this. And <clears throat> so 53% of O stars have three or more companions, or, or rather are in systems with three or more stars, have two or more companions. Okay, so even doing the binary stars is not even half of them yet. That's what you say. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it, it, it does. Okay. So <clears throat> oh, this is from Mo and Di Stefano. So this is as a function of mass. Um, <clears throat> so this shows the <clears throat> uh, fraction of stars. So the uh, singles are the red. And you notice that for solar type stars, you know, the sun, 60% of solar type stars are single. So the sun is not that unusual. But if you look at, say, 20 solar mass stars, it's only 10% of them are single. Uh, <clears throat> you know, some 30% of them are binary, but the majority of them are triple or quadruple or more. And, <clears throat> and if you ask about the fraction, which are actually close, so the typical hierarchical, the typical massive star is in a nearly contact binary with another comparable mass star. So those two clearly interact. Yeah, the next one outside is typically orbiting with orbital time scales of a year or so, days to years. So you basically just need to be 10 or 20 days to be stable, and years is plenty to have an interaction. So if the stars swell up as red giants, the majority of the triples and quadruples are actually going to interact with at least another one, and often in the quadruples is typically a close pair and another close pair of the day. So the, these two will interact with two of the other ones. So, yeah, so I think triple interactions are pretty common, basically. Still, maybe yeah. we can uh, wrap up and maybe we can move some of this to talk uh, more. Yeah, sure. So, so th I guess this right. makes a, <clears throat> yeah, so this makes a good stopping place. So I, I was going to sort of explain how to extrapolate everything to the rest of the universe, but I'll save that. Save that so, for the next yeah. uh, Thank you very much. <clears throat>